All right, so over the weekend, I finally had got a chance to sit down and check out this new Bruce Pritchard shoot interview that he conducted with RF Video that is about at least seven hours long. And I got to tell you guys off the break, this is a DVD that you'll want to check out. If you are a big fan of shoot interviews, this is definitely one that you need to add to your collection. This is like... One of the first times since Bruce Pritchard has been away from the WWE, he's been away from TNA, he just hasn't done anything with wrestling since his TNA release that he's been just so open about a lot of subjects that has gone on that he was part of, whether it was in the WWE, WWF, TNA, Global Mid-South, he just touches everything that's going on here. And I got to give props to my man, Rob Feinstein. He did a hell of a job interviewing Bruce. Every single possible question that you can possibly think of is asked to Bruce Pritchard during this whole seven hours. Some great content right here. Now, things had kicked off with Bruce mentioning his Mid-South origins, how him and Bill Watts, they tried to do their best to get along. He tried to respect him, but sometimes Watts really kind of came off very harsh, like a bully. And for the most part, they never really got along and how he actually recalled walking out on him and then realizing that that was a bad move and had his tail tucked in between his legs, came on back asking Bill for another shot because really Bruce thought that there was nothing that Watts could teach him. I mean, just really home in on this for a minute. Here's Bruce Pritchard, who's been living, eating, sleeping, wrestling since he was like a little kid and like the first time that he ever comes across wrestling in some type of a backstage capacity role or something like that he's about 10 12 years old so this guy started really early as far as getting a hand on tv announcing producing and all that and just imagine here he is like 10 years later he's like 20 22 years old and here's this guy trying to tell him oh well this is what you need to do and at this point Bruce has already spent about 10 years honing his craft but he would learn after he walked out on Bill that he wasn't in fact ready just yet talk about a good eye-opening experience right there now he was pretty close to guys like Ken Mantell Jim Ross million dollar man Ted DiBiase and ultimately it was really his relationship with those guys and a couple of others that was key into him going over to the WWF the first go round as in 1986 he recalled how he really wasn't making any money when he had came back the second go round and pretty much by this time it was looking as though Jim Crockett had came in and he just kind of felt that it was going to be a sinking ship after that so he started putting the plans in motion to move and just go elsewhere and for a, a lot of fans they thought that he had turned his back on Bill and everything but that wasn't even the case uh there was a guy by the name of Paul Bosch who was a close friend of his close associate who told him that hey really don't think it'd be a wise move to leave this promotion you should stick with us you know stay with us till the very end but Bruce was really more concerned about making more money and having an opportunity to build on something on a national basis as opposed to the Jim Crockett promotion and from there he had asked somebody that he knew was on his way to WWE if they could put in a word for him with Vince next thing you know he gets a phone call from Vince and pretty much the rest was history he went in depth about first impressions of Vince McMahon and say you know Vince he probably wouldn't want him to say it but Vince McMahon can really come off being intimidating and Vince McMahon doesn't mean to but that's just how he comes off but then when you take the time and you really get to know him he's just a cool fucking guy to be hanging around with 
And Bruce had actually told some really fun stories about how he, Pat Patterson and Vince, they would all just be driving around town looking for places to eat at 3, 4 in the morning or going and getting their drink on and all that. But the one thing that he did admit is that no matter what, even though they were on their little leisure downtime or whatever Vince is just always in that wrestling bubble he's always in that WWE bubble so he's basically always in that creative mode and here's a guy you learn this big man he doesn't get that much sleep it's like you could be in the office all day trying to come up with what to write next for Raw Smackdown and all that and basically you're going from like five in the morning until like maybe two three in the morning by the time you're done it's like Vince is just now going to bed and he's sleeping for like just about maybe three hours or whatever and Vince McMahon he just lives eats sleeps he he breeds wrestling and it, it's something that when you hear you're kind of like wow you know to have a guy that just operates like that and his whole mentality is I'm not gonna sleep I'm not gonna rest finally I'm not gonna just go off to the side and just have some R&R &R until I die. That is pretty much Vince's whole mentality for those of you that really weren't aware of that. But I thought it was great how Bruce went into his first impressions on Vince McMahon. It was something kind of eye opening there because we are so many fucked up stories about Vince McMahon, how Ice Cody is and all that, when on the contrary, he's not that at all. Bruce also talked about his first impressions with Pat Patterson, all around fun loving guy, really did a hell of a job putting Pat Patterson over as Pat Patterson, to really sum it up, is one of those type of guys that has a great mind for the business, especially when it comes to laying out finishes for matches. You could be a wrestler with your partner that you're going to be dancing with and tell Pat, okay, look, we're going to do ABC. But then Pat is just the way his mind clicks. He'll come at you and he'll go, okay, that's ABC. But after that, what about D through Z? Pat has just one of those minds that's just kind of like walk me through every single nook and cranny on how you're going to be telling your story. And he really helps them the talent that is really polish things off so that it really comes off as professional looking as possible and he just really did a good job putting pat patterson over uh he also talked about terry garvin how he really didn't have that much of a hands-on experience with him as terry was just handling the administration side of the business but for the most part, when he was there in the wwf he did a lot of producing pre-tape he did about everything, shadowing Vince, he did everything, working the gorilla position, he did just about everything when he was there. Something that I thought was very interesting was how Pritchard brought up the one star that he brought in that everybody thought he was crazy because they weren't really sure what the heck Bruce saw in him was Mean Mark, a.k.a. The Undertaker, as a lot of people felt that when they first saw him, he was just some big red-headed basketball player looking guy that wasn't going to go that far into the business but Bruce he had been checking out a handful of Undertaker's matches or Mark's matches and it was just something that really infatuated him it just kept making him say this is a guy I definitely want to bring into the company gotta see him come in and as you all saw, the rest was history. He did one hell of a job putting over The Undertaker, talking about how that gimmick, it's like this, the just the best gimmick of all time ever created in wrestling. And he also put the man behind it, Mark, over saying he's just a warm, true professional, all-around great guy. The topic soon turns into brother love and how it was created and uh bruce had admitted that he was watching a series of televangelists late at night or whatever basically talking about send in your money and all that and him and his partner eddie gilbert they would just watch these sermons and and they would basically use it for promos and that's basically how the brother love character had came up true story him and vince 
they would be driving around and they would be pitching ideas on what to do with the product next just getting their laugh on having drinks and all that and one day he said to Vince you know we should make a character just like Robert Tillman who was one of the main televangelist that would be doing these sermons and somehow this guy would be able to get money out of folks and he was doing the impressions for Vince and Vince said yeah we should do something like that and it was all about finding the right person to do it and Bruce said well look I know this like the back of my hand let me do it and Vince said no 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 we need somebody else there's no way you can pull it off and hey leave it to Bruce to prove Vince wrong rest was basically history and uh you know when he was brother love he really loved working with hulk hogan roddy roddy piper bobby the brain heenan but he also loved to still work on stuff behind the scenes work with the talent and all that soon things had switched up to wrestlemania 5 and when roddy roddy piper had retired and had came back he talked about the circumstances of that as they had came up with the whole morton downey jr versus roddy roddy piper and you got to remember at that time roddy piper he had just got done leaving the biz he had just successfully done that movie they live and he was done with wrestling as far as it had looked but when things had started to get set in motion for wrestlemania 5 and the idea was okay well let's have it be roddy roddy piper taking on morton downey jr and we have brother love kind of get caught in between all that it sounded like it was money so bruce pritchard would actually go meet up with roddy roddy piper and pitch to him the ideas and all that and you know Piper was on board. One thing that we learned is that Piper does not like impressions done of him. He doesn't like impersonations as his head apparently gets really, really red hot when uh, you're doing an impression of him. And he's kind of like, oh, that's nice. That's that, that, that thing, that little thing there you do. That's that's good. That's good. You know, but in retrospect, when he looked back on the whole thing, he kind of felt that all the right players Everything flowed very well, but he kind of felt that Morton Downey Jr. really didn't understand his role because you got to understand it from Morton's standpoint. Here was a guy that might have been going in for one night only to basically look like an ass, but he has to have his reputation intact when he gets ready to come back to the real world outside of wrestling and he's got to do his shows and all that and he's got to look like that hard ass and everything. So for Morton, it was kind of about trying to get himself over in a way where he still kind of had himself intact for his respected audience. So Bruce kind of gave me the impression that Morton really wasn't on board as it got closer to that segment, but I still think it had came off very well. Something I thought was very noteworthy was the constant rewrites for Raw and SmackDown. And as you all know, I'm sure you've heard it by now, Raw has just been rewritten so many times it can be rewritten right on up to the part of like 15 minutes before showtime and there's like a bunch of rewrites sometimes Vince McMahon will have stuff be rewritten right there during the course of that two or three hour episode so you're never really off the hook and back in the day there used to be a time where only thing Bruce was concerned about was getting to Smackdown because Once they got past Raw, SmackDown was just clear sailing because it was just going to be a pre-taped show and they could submit their draft for SmackDown like on a Friday, but then Vince would call them all in the office like Monday or Tuesday morning and it'd be like, okay, let's change this. So SmackDown was kind of like pending, but at the same time, It was treated early on like the redhead stepchild until Vince McMahon really started deciding to focus his attention on SmackDown and try to make it be as equal to Raw as well. And Bruce Pritchard just recalled that he really just did not 
like it when it came to creative as far as Raw and SmackDown because it would be a lot of headaches. And he described what it would be typically like for the TV producers, creative and all of them, which basically had consisted of him and Pat Patterson. Other guys would come into the play later, but they would all just be in a house somewhere at one of each other's houses and they would just be hammering out the script until it was done you know there really was no okay we're only going to do this until like 6 p.m and then we're going to call it a night they just hammered it out if it meant they had to be there all night long going into the wee hours of the morning only getting about 90 minutes of sleep if they're lucky and then have to get up for work the next day or they just go into ot and they have no sleep and they're trying to hammer everything out so that they can basically submit that final draft for approval they did whatever it took to make sure that the job was done and for him back in the day that meant he was pretty much working on the scripts for the shows and all that like every day i mean could you just imagine operating like that and for him at the time it was pretty cool because he was single didn't have any kids really wasn't any responsibility so he was able to have that type of great flexibility The steroid scandal was brought up about the whole Hulk Hogan testifying as far as if there was any backup plans in case Vince was to go to jail. And at that point, he, Pat Patterson, they were pretty much taking on the day-to-day operations of WWE and the production of the shows. If you guys recall, there was actually a few times there where Vince McMahon was out of commission. He had to have some surgery done or whatever, and the guys that were in charge was Bruce and Pat. And so as far as Bruce was concerned, if the worst case scenario were to occur where Vince was going to be seeing jail time, it would still be business as usual because Vince had created the company in a way Where if something were to happen to him, it, you know, okay, well, WWE is going out of business. It wasn't even anything like that at all. There were already people in place that could basically pick up the mantle and just run with the company. Soon things had switched to the sex scandal as Bruce, he really didn't have anything to say about Terry Garvin because he wasn't close to him like that. He really didn't meddle in his affairs and all that, but he defended the hell out of Pat Patterson and said, hey, Pat is one of these type of guys. I would definitely trust him with my kids. And as a matter of fact, I've let my kids spend the night with him many times. Okay, so he's homosexual. He likes guys. So what? I don't care about that. At the end of the day, he's a guy. I'm a guy. Does he play around a little bit? Does he rib guys a bit? Yeah, he does. But he's all around a sweetheart. He's a nice guy. He basically thought it was bullshit what was going on with Pat Patterson. They also had talked about Murray Hodges, who was one of the guys that had came forth with the allegations and all that. And he said, hey, he had a great radio voice. He had a great look, but to his knowledge, he was fired just shortly after he left the first go round. Ric Flair, you guys remember when he came into the WWF? He felt that they moved Ric Flair way too fast. What they had did with that Royal Rumble, having him win it and everything, he said looking back on it, that was just for him, one of the best Royal Rumbles that he's ever seen of all time because he just loved the way they had handled Flair. But that six months leading up to that Royal Rumble, just skyrocketing Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan, he felt that it should have been a nice slow build, especially when things had soon started to go the route of Hogan versus Randy Savage. He just felt that they moved too fast with Ric Flair that they really should have taken their time with him and something else that I thought was very interesting was the whole what if it was Ric Flair that was the million dollar man Ted DiBiase that's one of those things that make you go hmm when you hear that speaking of Hulk Hogan Randy Savage it was discussed how each of them were as the WWE champions and Bruce put them over very well. He said that they were very good 
Ultimate Warrior's name was brought up and he said Warrior was difficult to work with at a lot of times. He came off as a guy that wasn't appreciative, in particular wasn't appreciative of the machine, the people that got him to the dance to make him be the man. The age old question is soon brought up on why guys like Mr. Perfect, Honky Talk Man, Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase, Jake Roberts were never WWF champions. And it was very interesting to hear Bruce's take on this because for him, you had guys like The Rock, Undertaker. They didn't need the title because of the caliber that they were. They didn't need it. He said Million Dollar Man was, in fact, WWF champion. If you guys recall, it might have been only for a week, but he was the WWF champion. Honky Talk Man, Mr. Perfect. In Bruce's defense, there were just certain guys that, in his honest opinion, maybe because of what was going on at the time, it never happened. And you got to understand, back then, it was all about seeing those top strong baby faces go over which he really didn't necessarily agree with because he loved the whole mentality of okay here's a heel wrestler here's a guy that is holding on to the championship and we're building up this baby face we're building him up so damn good that one day he's going to meet up with this heel champion and he's going to take the belt away he liked trying to operate like that but at the time that's not what was going on. And I think for you old school wrestling fans, if you really home in on what was going on in a lot of wrestling promotions back then, you could definitely agree. The baby faces were really getting over. The fans were in that I want my baby face champion. So very good points that he had brought up right there. He did say that Rick Rude was a guy that should have been WWF champion. Now, as far as his first departure from the WWF, basically, he was given a choice. Either he could get along with this former NBC sports executive guy named John, or he can maybe go with Undertaker on the road because the brother love Undertaker thing. It was white hot. He decided to stay behind because he loved what he was doing in the back and all that. And eventually, him and John, they just did not get along, and he just decided to part ways with the company. Now, as some of you guys know, after he left WWF, there was that brief time for like about six, seven months. He had went to Global. Basically, long story short, he really didn't see much he could do with that promotion because it was a sinking ship kind of seemed like maybe at one point there was a little little bright spot of hope and maybe turning a new leap of faith with the promotion but cost cutting measures is what really had led to the ultimate demise of global honorable mentions include bruce on whether or not vince mcmahon likes being surrounded by yes men that's farther from the truth as he informed Rob that if he ever had the opportunity to sit down with Vince, Vince would definitely tell him that he does not like Yes Men. He likes pitching his ideas out there, being challenged creatively and all that. And that furthermore, he was one of the main guys that would always be going back and forth with Vince. They would be arguing a lot of times on different things. He also gave his take on what it was like to see the click do the infamous curtain call. Shane Douglas getting buried. Origins of Monday Night Raw. HBK versus Razor Ramon in the first ladder match. It turns out this was actually an idea that came from Bret Hitman Hart. It's something that he was doing in Calgary years back and he wanted to try to implement it in the WWF and it's kind of funny that the first ladder match at Shawn Michaels Razor Ramon Bret Hart was trying to be part of that but as far as Bruce was concerned things didn't quite click right at the time between Shawn and Bret but look at how it was clicking with Shawn and Razor good stuff right there also had talked about the fake Razor and Diesel coming into the company. It was just basically about being insulted by WCW back when Scott Hall, Kevin Nash had left for 
WCW and they were doing all it was kind of like they were still doing their characters into WWE that was like an infringement on their copyright and abuse of their trademarks so when they did the fake Razor and Diesel it was basically their way of telling WCW hey we own these characters they're our trademark I agree the way that they went about it it was kind of like yeah probably one of those moments that you know probably wish never happened the Montreal screw job was brought up turns out Bruce he didn't know any of that stuff was going to go down he was actually watching the match between Sean and Brett from the gorilla position where Owen and British Bulldog and he didn't realize what the heck had happened until after the bell had rang as Bruce was like who the hell rang the bell and Bulldog says to him they just screwed Brett it just screwed Brett. That's when it really had clicked in. He was actually in the locker room when Vince McMahon had got punched uh, by Brett. The discussion was also brought up about why did the, the WWF at the time stop working with Beyond the Mad. And he said, well, if you guys recall, we were working with them right on up through that night in Montreal but after what had went down with Brett and Vince that was pretty much it and the other thing that they had a problem with was when it was originally pitched to them it was uh through a friend Ron Howard who said look you know these guys they want to do this documentary it's not going to be a commercial release and then turns out these guys turn right back around and you know they tried to release it in theaters and for them that was like a misrepresentation and so that's why they gave the guys behind beyond the mat such a hard time ecw was brought up turns out they had some type of financial arrangements with paul Heyman. bruce would not go into details on what that was but they had arrangements made they basically felt that with ECW, there were key guys in that promotion that they would love to see come on through to the WWF. Those guys included Eddie Guerrero, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Brian Pillman, just to name a few. But they had arrangements with ECW because basically the way they had it set up, it was, okay, well, look, we'll come to you guys we're eyeballing these guys that's in ECW. When you have them nice and ready, send them on up to the WWF. And so they tried to do their best to help ECW stay afloat, but they did have some type of financial arrangements with them. Honorable in-depth mentions include Stone Cold Steve Austin's rise in the WWF. The Rock, I thought this was hilarious as originally The Rock, he did not want to be in the Nation of Domination because he thought it was a black thing. And Bruce is like, what the hell are you talking about? It's a black thing. Never really looked at it like that. And he said, look, you know, why don't you just go there, go the heel route? It would be really awesome. But Dwayne, he didn't want to do that. And then Jim Ross, he kind of got in the rock's ear and he said, well, look, what if you kind of implemented your heel character in a way like what Deion Sanders is doing? And he showed him or rather he told him about some stuff that he had saw with Deion Sanders talking in third person, basically saying, well, Dion's going to make X amount of touchdowns today. Well, Dion thinks that post game he's going to go and next thing you know the rest was history things just started clicking other honorable mentions include what it was like to see vince russo go to wcw the final nitro in panama city ddp in the wwe buff bagwell in the wwe the wcw invasion that i do want to touch upon this was something that i thought was very eye-opening as far as Bruce was concerned, the WCW invasion, it kind of never really should have happened because they didn't have the true stars of WCW. And you got to remember when WCW got bought out by the WWF, there was a lot of stars in WCW that had these lucrative contracts set up where basically if they were going to go work for the WWF, they had to cough up that deal. And... It's like, okay, well, all this money that I'm making, why do I want to cough that up to go actually work when I can just sit at home, 
go to the mailbox and collect a paycheck. So for a lot of the main top guys in WCW, that's exactly what they did. Other than Booker T, Bruce really didn't see anybody else that was worth really bringing into the WWF and try to skyrocket to the top. He talked about Sting. As far as he was concerned, he really didn't see anything valuable in Sting. He didn't feel that Sting was worth the amount of money that was in his contract at the time of the WCW buyout. Something else that was very interesting, it turns out there was an original plan that was going to be set up in motion where there was going to be X amount of writers, talent that was going to go exclusively over to WCW. And basically, it was going to be like, okay, well, WWE, let's see what you guys can do. And then we're going to try to top that. They weren't going to share talent at all. They were still going to try to have their TV deal be in place and all that. But things did not fall through. They had met a lot of resistance, mainly from TV executives and all that. So it was an idea that when you hear that, you're kind of like, wow, that really would have been badass to see what WWE would have been able to do had they been allowed to have WCW remain on TV and they just keep going at it. It's just kind of jacked up the way that uh, that thing had played out. Stephanie McMahon was soon brought up uh, about her rise to be in the position that she is right now, as well as Triple H. And Bruce had nothing but kind things to say about both of them, especially Triple H. His rise to power basically take away the fact that he married Stephanie McMahon, which he feels Triple H just gets a really bad rep for as a result. But take that off the table. If you had to go with one guy that you really wanted to be the successor to the kingdom and all that, Triple H would be that guy. He has just, when you look back on his career, he brings up a very good argument. He's been in there day in, day out, never got involved with drugs, never was involved in any scandalous crap or whatever. He did his job. He put other people over. He always did what was best for the business. When the click had left, he ate shit for a good minute, but he still continued on. And yeah, I totally agree with him 100%. That is a guy that has that wrestler's mindset. And as far as he's concerned, the company's going to be in very good hands if and when Vince McMahon decides that he no longer wants to have anything to do with the company. Something that I thought was very interesting right here, one of my colleagues, Wade Keller of PW Torch, was brought up as Rob had told him, hey, you know, how do you respond to the rumor about this whole WrestleMania script that you supposedly released because you were disgruntled with the company or whatever? And Bruce said, hey, I've never done anything like that. I've never done anything in a way that would hurt the business, that would hurt the WWF. And as far as Wade Keller is concerned, he is a liar. And he was very passionate about Wade Keller. He said that is a guy that he does not have respect for because this is a guy that does not have any close ties to the business. He has never taken a bump, nothing. He just basically said this is a guy who just likes spreading gossip. So very interesting words right there. Conversation soon turned to the Chris Benoit story and how they had handled dealing with his death, especially that two-hour episode of Raw that was dedicated to them. On Linda McMahon running for Senate, the PG-13 rating, why it really had changed to PG-13, which really it was all about making more revenue. That's the bottom line for that. Now, as far as his exit from the WWF in 2008 had went, he just got to a point where he was tired. He was a little bit disgruntled with some of the things that was going on. He was going in like nine different directions, and then he had something going on the side, and 
he just decided that it was just time for him to roll out. It was actually a mutual decision between he and necessary people involved. He just decided it was time to go. Now, things would soon switch up to what led to him going to TNA Wrestling. And basically, he had been in a few talks with Jeff Jarrett. And he decided to eventually come on in as a producer. And one of the things that he noticed was a big problem for TNA was that they ran so fast. And his whole thing was, okay, look, slow down, tell the story. Another thing that he realized was that each talent had their contract set up differently where, okay, I can't do this with this person because this person is only going to do X, Y, Z, but this person over here can do X, Y, Z, but they can't do blah, blah, blah. So he kind of went through a lot of weird stuff that was going on in dealing with the talent there. One thing that he stressed that he thought was very eye-opening was TNA having some type of a crisis identity because on the one hand, it looked as though TNA was trying to go the route of just being a TV company. But then it's like, okay, they're trying to be a wrestling company. All right, well, if you're going to be a wrestling company, then you kind of got to do these things over here with the live events. But then you're doing this thing with the pay-per-view. So it's kind of like, okay, what do you really want to be? And for him, it was just really bizarre because he had like a hard time figuring out what exactly was TNA trying to do with their product. When he first got there, he was given a lot of free reign. Anything that he wanted, it was done. But it looked like towards the end when push came to shove, they weren't really willing to go with him a hundred percent and for him on top of all that there wasn't enough consistency especially as far as building x amount of revenue and if it were up to him he would have people do their jobs and be accountable for it as it just really came off as if during his tenure in tna there was a lot of mismanagement that was going on he called Dixie Carter a very nice lady, but very gullible. He also spoke very candidly about what was going on during the period where Bobby Roode, Devon, Hawk Hogan, RVD, they had all their contracts basically pop up at several wrestling websites. There was problems. The contracts were being lapsed. They weren't being renewed. What was going on? Well, Bruce shed some light on that with Bobby Roode. He talked with Bobby Roode. It was a done deal, and basically Bobby Roode had called him up and said, hey, I still don't have my new contract. What's going on? And Bruce is like, we just talked about that. It was squash. What are you talking about? And Bobby Roode told him, hey, I, it's true. I still don't have my contract. I don't know what's going on. And so basically from Bruce's standpoint, certain guys that he wanted to have their contracts be renewed without any problem – he would basically delegate it to somebody else and whoever that person or group of people were, because he didn't name names, they did not fall through on that. When it came to Devon, that was just a mutual thing. When it came to Hulk Hogan, Hogan apparently had an auto renewal. So why it spread it the way that it did about, oh, they forgot to re-sign Hulk Hogan, I'm not sure. Rob Van Dam, I thought, was a very eye-opening experience right here. When it came to Rob Van Dam, him and Bruce, they had verbally worked out a deal that was going to see RVD work limited dates for a certain amount of money. And basically, long story short, RVD getting, uh, did not get the new contract, and he tried to call Bruce. Bruce is like, what do you mean you didn't get the new deal we talked about this already, and once again, Bruce goes to these certain individuals or group of people to make sure that it happens, and they're like, okay, yeah, we're on it, we're on it, and long story short, RVD did not sign a new contract with TNA, and when he tried calling people in the headquarters to find out what was going on, nobody returned his calls so for him, he felt like he was totally disrespected. That's why if you guys recall in recent interviews when RVD talked about what had 
happened there in TNA. That's why he's been saying what he's been saying. That's why he's been taking little jabs at TNA because of the way they handled him in re-signing a new deal. Budget cuts was soon brought up and it came at a very critical time. If you guys recall that summer where we saw like names just dropping off left and right. Bruce was actually on vacation because he was thinking about what his next move was going to be with the TNA promotion. And keep in mind, this guy, he's in charge of talent and all that, talent relations. He's not being consulted on all these releases that's going on. And he's hearing about these releases while he's on vacation because he has friends and colleagues calling him up, telling him what's going on. So in essence, he's really not even able to enjoy his vacation. So by the time he comes back, he's like, OK, guys, you hired me to do X, Y, Z. What the hell is going on right here? And then it came time to restructure his contract. And they basically wanted him to move to Nashville. At the time, he wasn't going to do it because he had a lot of personal things that was going on in the family. So he wasn't going to do it. But in the end, he said, you know, look, I can commute from Houston to Nashville. I don't have a problem doing that. And they're like, no, you have to come live in Nashville full time. So he marinated on it for about a week. He came back to him and he said, look, OK, I need about 90 days. And yeah, I'll go on ahead. I'll move to Nashville. They said, OK, if you're going to take this job. You're going to have to be in Nashville within the week. Talk about ouch. And he was like, well, I'm sorry, I can't do that. And they said, well, here's what we can do then. We can make you be an independent producer, basically an independent contractor. And he liked the idea of that. But when he found out how much his pay was going to be, to quote him, it was insulting. So you can only imagine how small that amount was. And after that, he said, OK, I I'm done with the company. And keep in mind, he wasn't even dealing with Dixie Carter and all that. He was dealing with a CFO uh, in, in the company. He never heard from Dixie, you know, when all this stuff was going on. He never spoke with her. So it was just very unfortunate how all of that stuff uh, had went down. Other honorable mentions for this DVD had included what it was like pro and con wise working with Jason Harvey, Eric Bischoff, Hulk Hogan. He also spoke about the knockouts, addressed that age old myth about why did it kind of come off on TV as if he was kind of hard on the knockouts division. And in his own defense, there were some folks that just came in there and they just funked up the whole place. There were some people that just thought they could just come in there and get off on their looks. And this kind of actually, I, I thought this was very, very, very interesting. He brought up Athena. I'm sure you guys know about her. He actually had a conversation with her where, you know, he's telling her, look, you know, this is what you got to do to improve. And hey, we can make it happen for you. What we can do, we can sing you on down to OVW. We'll pay you to do your training, make you get nice and spot on. And she goes, well, that's really nothing. As far as the pay goes, I make more money waitressing. And so he tells her, well, then why the fuck are you doing this? Why are you wasting our time? If you can make more money wait waitressing, then go do that. But I thought that uh, was very interesting in itself. And for those of you that don't know Athena, she's basically a independent circuit wrestler. She's wrestled for promotions that's included Shimmer, Women's Superstars Uncensored. She also did some stuff for Anarchy Championship Wrestling, uh, where she had held two ACW singles titles. So that gives you a little bit of a backdrop on her. Pro Wrestling Illustrated, they had ranked her PWI's number 25 in their 2013 PWI Top 50 Female. So that gives you a little bit of a backdrop on her as she was trained by Booker T. So, But getting back on track, Bruce also gave his take on key guys that he felt would succeed or fail in the WWE. Bobby Roode, hands down, he feels that that guy would succeed. AJ Styles, he had a question mark on him. Bully Ray, no doubt, would be a top heel in the WWE right now. 
abyss very interesting words for abyss he said he's always concerned with his shadow if you will he's always nervous about himself and if he's doing things right and for him he f just feels that that weakness that he displays would get him eaten up in the wwe he doesn't think that he would last one minute Funny note was the discussion about the X Division. Bruce Pritchard did not understand what the hell the X Division was, and he tried for the love of him to get people that even created the X Division to tell him just what exactly was the X Division, what was it about, and they weren't able to tell him for the life of him. And that's why there was that period there where you saw like these weird triple threat matches that were going on, and like whoever won that. They went into like this semi-final with another person that won a triple threat. And those two basically met the X Division champion for the title. That's why Bruce had did his own unique spin to it. Because he thought it was just silly to have guys be climbing up the ropes to go reach for a wooden X in the center. And basically risk falling off of it and breaking their neck. And next thing you know, they're paralyzed from the head on down. He just thought... All that was just downright silly, especially when nobody could tell him what the heck the X Division was about. And I know for a lot of fans, it's like, oh, well, X Division, there's a weight limit. And as far as Bruce was concerned, okay, well, what's the weight limit? And they really couldn't specify. And it was like, okay, well, what's the X Division about? Well, it's about small guys. Okay, so it's about small guys. Well, then if it's about small guys, then what are we doing seeing AJ Styles in the main event against Abyss? Shouldn't AJ Styles be a small guy? And so you had all these little things that were just very conflicting as far as describing what the X Division was about. So that's why Bruce did the X Division the way that he did. Some people may not approve of it, but I think you guys have to at least appreciate and respect his position and why he operated it the way that he did. Other than that, that was pretty much it for the shoot interview. He's still working on his book at this point. It looks like it's titled Something to Wrestle With. He's trying to work with a few colleagues on producing some TV shows. And uh, that's pretty much it. You know, for me, overall, this was a very insightful interview. I actually watched all seven hours of this on two discs back to back. Really had enjoyed it. For me, there was actually a low point during this whole shoot interview. And it came in the form, surprisingly. It had nothing to do with Rob. It had nothing to do with Bruce. I don't know who the guy is. I don't know his name. But the low point for me, there was this one guy and I never caught his name, but he would just inject himself at times and ask Bruce some questions that I just felt really should not have been asked. It just kind of felt like he was trying to get his two cents in there and basically be like, oh, I got a chance to talk with Bruce Pritchard. It just kind of seemed like he was trying to put his own stamp on things. Now, look, on the first disc, it's pretty much Rob interviewing Bruce. To my knowledge, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think this other guy really comes into play until the second disc, really. And there's there's like a period where like for about maybe almost 25 minutes, it feels like a half hour that Rob is quiet while this other guy is reading to Bruce Pritchard questions that they had gathered up from social media. And the questions, honestly, they just came downright silly. They sounded stupid. It's I could have sworn it and I'm usually a good judge of reading people's faces and all that. And Bruce probably wouldn't admit it in public. Uh, maybe in private, but it, it, to me, Bruce just kind of came off body language wise that at some points he was a little bit annoyed with some of the questions that this kid had to say. And I, this guy probably isn't even a kid. He's probably a young adult. So I don't mean no disrespect, but the questions that he had and he just stumbled with the questions, there was a lot of ums and, and all that. And I don't know about you guys, but it's like, for the price tag that this DVD is, by the time I ended up paying for it with shipping and all that, I paid almost up to $45, okay? And I'm like, okay, so for $45 for me, 
to kind of hear this guy fumble through the questions and all that it's kind of like okay you have Bruce Pritchard right here you know when he's coming you have plenty of time to kick on back and figure out what question you want to ask him redline the ones that you think really are not worth it because you don't know when you're going to get another opportunity like that again if you're lucky you know what i'm saying so you got to treat that interview like it's your one and only shot and if that's going to be your one and only shot at least you can come back a year or two later and say hey i did a hell of a damn job interviewing this guy I did a hell of a job asking my questions to this guy and this guy he just really fumbled with the questioning some of it was just silly a good example he said something along the lines of rick flair as you know he's been dealing with a lot of financial problems over the years does it surprise you i just thought that was a wasted question right there there was a couple of times where rob actually had to step in and try to help clean up the questioning that this guy was asking but I mean other than that I was really happy when he said I got one more question for you and then I'm gonna sign off I was really happy because I was in that zone between Rob and Bruce I really had enjoyed what was going on right there uh, the other guy did not sound that commanding there were so many ums that were going on that half the damn time I actually forgot what the question was. So Rob, he's probably going to end up listening to this review. Hopefully I'm not being too critical of your friend or associate, but I would love to see you, Rob, just do more of the one-on-one. -on -one. If your friend is going to get involved, make sure he is more polished off and he is ready to go. Do something like me and my other colleagues do when we're gathering up questions on what we want to ask certain guests or whatever. Have a green check mark on the ones that's like, that's good, that's damn good, we definitely need to ask, ask that. And skip the ones, just mark it in red, do it like that. That way you can just be like boom, boom, boom. And when you're recording, there's no fumbling because the less editing you have to do, the better, right, right. But overall, despite all that, I would have to say this was a very insightful shoot interview. I would say for those of you that's curious if this is something that you should pick up, hell yes. I say buy this. You can get it right now at rfvideo.com. I recommend you get it. I'm giving this a 9 out of 10, a really great, insightful DVD. Good stuff. Now, right now... You can get it on RF Video for $24.95. I repeat, you can get it right now for $24.95. And uh, you can't beat that for seven hours. You can't beat that. But that's going to do it. To those of you that had checked out this Bruce Pritchard DVD, I want to hear from you all. What did you think about this DVD? Post your comments down below. For those of you that have not seen the DVD yet after listening to this review does it make you want to purchase it if so let me know post your comments down below also if you appreciated this review or you got any tips for me to maybe make our shoot dvd reviews even better please feel free to post your comments down below as we love getting feedback from you guys i know some of you are probably going to be wondering what's the next shoot dvd i'm going to be reviewing for you all i'm going to keep a tight lid on that for now uh but let me know how you guys had appreciated this shoot dvd and if you don't mind us reviewing more shoot DVDs, especially ones that might be this lengthy for you all. So that's why we pretty much made this be a deluxe DVD review because there was just so much that was covered during the course of this seven hour two disc set. So hopefully you guys appreciate it and you've been able to stay with us this long. Hey, if it's your first time checking us out, I'd love to have you subscribe to us as we're always posting great content here. Whether it be reviews, interviews, you name it. We dip into a little bit of everything over here. I'd love to have you subscribe to us so that you never miss out as we're always posting great content here on a weekly basis. You can also share this review a number of ways. You can retweet this. You can Google Plus it. You can Facebook it. It's one of the many ways you can spread the good word about our content. 
that's going to do it. Thank you so much for checking out the RCWR Show's Shoot DVD review for Bruce Pritchard by RF Video. That's all I hear from you guys next go round. You all be safe and be kind to one another. See you all next go round. Take care.